minds they're thinking well the person who's going to come and is going to, going to save us he is going to he, he knows everything he's going to know our history he's going to be able to tell us what to do and so as jesus shows up and is talking to this woman he's able to tell her kind of her history and who she is and how she's done things she shouldn't have been doing and she's like oh my word this is the son of god this is who we've been told is going to come and save us. And so these people, these Samaritans, they believe in God, or they believe in Jesus, because he knows their history, right? He's able to tell them things that only they have known, or only they are hoping for, and they believe. But not everyone is like that. Not everyone can just be told a story, or be told their past, and believe. There are so many others, and we see this in Scripture, that they need proof. They want proof. God, if you right now would bring a lightning bolt and hit the ground, then I know you're real. What? It doesn't really work that way. But these people, they wanted proof. And so what's happening is, they, they need to see what this Jesus person can do. And so that starts with our story in John chapter 4, and we're going to start at verse 43. And it says, After two days he departed from Galilee, where Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his, his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. For they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. He asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus said, had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was, not the, this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. So as we take a look at this, this story, as we take a look at this passage, I want to go back and I want to kind of break things down for us to kind of have a little bit better picture as to what exactly is going on. And so as we start to dive into this, in verse 43 it says, For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own home. So what's happening is Jesus is heading north into Galilee, which is the northern part of where he's from, which is Nazareth. And it's possible that Jesus was starting to recognize that there was some issues that were taking place with the leaders, uh, re the religious leaders. And even though it was kind of just starting, pretty soon it's going to get really bad. But he knows what's taking place, and he thinks, I need to go and I need to 
kind of fix this. I need to work on this. But what I found to be very interesting is they don't really say that he's born in Bethlehem. They don't call him a Judean. What's crazy is in Matthew chapter 21, verse 22, it says, And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And in John chapter 7, verse 52, it says, They replied, Are you the Galilean too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. But what's happening in chapter 4, verse 43, is Jesus knew that people responded to his ministry, and they were responding in a way that just wasn't, well, it wasn't right. It wasn't honoring to him. And so what I believe is he's going back to kind of work on the seed that he's already sowed, that he's already kind of poured into these people. And he wants to go and he wants to make some corrections because as humans, and as you know, we can so often be on one track and in the very next second, we're going somewhere different, right? Because we want to fix things on our own. Because we believe that we have control over our lives and we can do what we want to do and it's just easier that way, right? But it's not. We so often can mess it up and cause many issues. So as we move forward into verse 45, we see that the Galileans welcome Jesus because of what he has done back in John chapter 2. Whenever Pastor Aaron was talking to us and he was telling us about the wedding and the miracle that he did, right? And his mom was like, you need to make the wine out of this water. And he's like, it's not time. And yet he still does it. They see this miracle, and so they believe because of this miracle that he's done. And they welcome him. And they say, ooh, come, come, do more. We loved what you did last time. The water into wine, do it again. Yeah, we like that. And he knows that that's not exactly the right thing. They want him to come for the wrong reasons. But whenever we take a look at this story that I just read to you, we see this dad, this father, and he has desperate faith. Desperate faith. I mean, think about it. In your own life, in your own, and what's going on, there are so many times whenever our faith is desperate. We're so lost and we just don't know what to do. And we've tried to fix it. We've tried and tried and tried and we've done everything. We've talked to people. We've, we've sought counseling. We've done everything and yet I'm just not getting the answer that I want. And so our faith becomes desperate. And honestly, it reminds me of a time in my life whenever I had to really seek God because it was a desperate time. And it happened right before we moved up here to Cincinnati. And what was going on was I was working for a very large church, a, a church that many, many people, and I was doing everything I could. You know, I was uh, pouring into fellowship, or FCA, Fellowship Christian Athletes, at two different schools. I was going to the schools every single week and having lunch with students. We were putting on big, massive events and big camps, and, you know, we were doing everything we could, and, and they would give you a goal, and they would say, we want you to have 20 students, and I would bring 40 students, and then they would say, we want you to have five leaders, and I would bring 30 leaders, and I was trying to do everything they asked and go above and beyond that. And I'm not saying that to toot my own horn. No, I'm saying that because I want you to have kind of a history of what I was doing. And then one day they brought me into the office and they said, Tyler, we just don't think you're a fit. So we're going to let you go. What? Oh, no, 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 you've done nothing wrong. You're very well liked. You've done everything we've asked you to do, but you're just not a fit. But... We want you to stay on for two more months to promote camp, even though you're not going to go to camp. And we want you to not tell anyone for two months. But you're just not a fit. But I have three kids and a wife, and one of my kids is not even one yet. 
What am I going to do? I, I'm the only person, I'm the only one that, that provides for my family at this time. Sorry, man. We just want to go a different direction. At that moment in time, my faith became desperate because I didn't know what I was going to do. I was scared. I had anxiety going out the roof, and my mind was blown at the fact that they were even saying, we still want you to be here for two months to promote everything and to do everything. But at the end of it, sorry. What am I going to do? I didn't know. I mean, I had family that was going to be able to help if we needed help, and, you know, Stacy was so helpful during that time. But I was so desperate for something. I didn't know. I didn't know what God was doing, and it hurt. And maybe some of you guys in this room have had very similar experiences to that. And what's crazy is we see how we deal with situations like that whenever it hits us. But whenever we read stuff like that, we're like, oh, man, I really hate that for that guy. That really stinks. Are we going to know what to do? Are we going to know how to handle situations like that? Or are we just going to crumble into a ball and say, I'm done? What are we going to do? We have desperate faith in that time. Now in verse 46, verse B, or, uh, verse 46b, it says, And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. Now, who in here has kids? Go ahead, yeah, raise your hand, right? You, whenever your kids are ill, is that not the worst? It's awful. Let's be real, it's awful. Because think of it this way. You know that if they're going to throw up, it's going to be in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And you know you're going to get up and you're going to have to change the sheets at 2 in the morning and you're going to be grumpy. Or, I didn't even put this in my notes, but all I could think of is times whenever our kids come in the room and we're like, because <gasps> they scare us, right? You know, and they're like, I threw up. And then, oh gosh, now I got to get up and I have to take care of everything. So you know that that happens. You know that it's gonna, that's going to happen or you're going to be out of the pocket for a couple of days because your kids have a fever and they can't go to school or you can't leave the house because they're sick. Or if it's really bad, you're taking them to the hospital and now you're waiting for the doctors to give you an answer as to what's happening and why this is going on and you're scared and you haven't slept and you're sleeping on this couch that they call a bed, right? And you're like, God, I need your help. Lord, please help, right? And this dad, we see this dad where he is at this point of, God, I, I need your help, so I'm going to go seek uh, wisdom. I'm going to go seek help from this person named Jesus who has been doing all these things and has been doing all these miracles, and I need his help. Seven, it says, when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, we know very little about this man. We don't know if he was a Jew or a Gentile. We don't know his name. We know that he was a government official. We know he worked for the government, which means more than likely he could possibly have worked for Herod, which Herod does not like Jesus. And we know that his son is ill. That's all we know about this man. But what is interesting and what's important to know is that he has belief that Jesus can do something. He has belief that Jesus can come and heal. And so he's going to Jesus and he's saying, God, come, come, just help, like heal my son. Please just come with me, come with me. I, I know if you're with me, I know that if you come, you can heal my child. He's desperate. His faith is completely desperate and he just needs any kind of help that he can because he's tried everything. And as parents, you guys know, and maybe if you're not a parent and you're a student or you're single or you're grandparents, you know what that feels like to be desperate. You know what that feels like to need help. But Jesus' response was very important. It, it, only he could respond this way. And in verse 48, so Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, 
what's happening is Jesus is not specifically scolding the dad, right? What's crazy is the word you is plural. So he's basically saying y'all, okay? Y'all will not believe unless you see signs and wonders. And he's talking to the dad, but at the same time, he's talking to the whole crowd that's there, telling them, y'all won't believe unless you see that, because that's what they want. They want to see all of these miracles and signs, and they want to see him do all these things like turn water into wine and, and heal people right there and, and have you know, people get up and walk away who haven't been able to walk. They want to see all these signs. And he's saying, you honestly don't believe unless you see this. So do you really believe, or you just want to see something cool? And I think in our reality of today, we so often want to just see something cool happen because otherwise it can be boring. It's how we feel. We get bored very quickly. I mean, they have apps out there with only 30-second videos because they know that people's intention span can't last longer than that. So scroll, next video. Scroll, okay, I'm good. I got my feel for the day. We want to see something amazing, and if we don't see that, we're ready to move on. And he's saying, listen, that's not, that's not what's happening here. And have you guys ever heard the term, seeing is believing? Yeah. That was even back then. Seeing it, if I see this, I'm going to believe it. If you do this in front of me, I'm going to believe you. And that happens so often with people who are not believers in Christ, but at the same time, even believers in Christ also say, see when I believe it. They may not say that completely to, to God, but they still say it. We still want to see the signs and the miracles, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 you're not getting it right. So in verse 49, he then says, the official says to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. He believes that Jesus can come. He believes that Jesus can heal. He believes and has faith that Jesus can do something amazing, but he has to be there to do it. He has to be there. God, I, I need you to come with me. I need you. And then in verse 50, it says, Jesus said to him, go, your son will, be, well, your son will live. The man believed the words that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. See, this man's belief changed. This man has this desperate faith, is begging for Jesus to come to heal. And in that moment, whenever Jesus says, go, your son will be alive, your son is alive, your son's going to live, his desperate faith becomes deliberate faith. So now he has to be obedient, and, and there's two ways that he can go about doing this. One, he can continue to beg for Jesus to come with him. He can continue to beg and say, God, uh, Jesus, I, I need you to come. I, I know you said it, but I need, you to, I need to see you do this. I need you to be there. Or, he can have this deliberate faith and he can listen to the command that Jesus has told him and he can leave and he can have trust and have faith and believe that what Jesus said is true and go. Parents, does that now sound hard? Like, I, I don't know how easy it would be for me to say, okay, I, I hear you, I'm going to go now whenever I know that my son's been dying 20 miles away. But this man listens. He's obedient and he believes. And then in verse 51, as he was going down, his servant met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Now, Let's nerd out for a second. Seventh hour. There are, some, there are some pastors that says, the hour really doesn't matter. And as that may be true, because that's not the importance of this whole story, I think the hour kind of helps with the whole story. Because there's two ways of looking at the seventh hour. Some believe that the seventh hour is 7 a.m., 
and some believe that the seventh hour is 1 p.m. Now, the reason being is because there's a difference in hours in regards to whether you're a Jew or you're a Greek or, you know, different stuff like that, okay? So, seventh hour. Now, after doing some research and digging into this, I believe and I want to say the seventh hour more than likely would be the 1 p.m. time. Here's why. It's 20 miles away. Now, 20 miles is a big deal. I'm up here on stage right now because Pastor Aaron is running a marathon. That's 26.2 miles, right? He's going to run an eight and a half minute mile. I'm praying he does better than that. That's pretty awesome though. Eight and a half minute mile. He's going to finish the marathon in about four hours. We know that through this culture, you do not run. That's childish. And what we know is where he lives to where Jesus is, he has to go uphill to get to him. And it's about a 20 mile walk. So if you think about that and you do the math, the 20 mile walk means that it's going to take him all day to get there. It's a long walk. So for him to be there at 7 a.m. would mean, hey, Jesus just told me that my son is healed, so now I can do that 20 mile walk back and I can get there that very same day. That doesn't happen. It says in scripture that the very next day he meets his servants halfway right? So that makes me believe that the time frame is at 1 p.m. Because now what's even crazier is his faith and his belief of what Jesus has said has to be even stronger because Jesus tells him that and he can't leave to go home immediately. He now has to stay the night in that town and wait for daylight to come because you do not travel at night there. They do not have cars with headlights and Red Bull to be able to get through the night, okay? They, it was not safe to travel at night. And so he knows that I have to go back to sleep. I'm going to wake up early in the morning. I'm going to travel. I'm going to get there. And I'm going to see if what Jesus has told me is true. And come to find out that miracle does happen. So even though the time frame doesn't matter, it kind of does. Because the dad's faith had to be even stronger, and he had to wait. And as y'all know, he probably didn't get any sleep that night because all he's thinking about is, is my son safe? Is my son alive? Oh, I hope he is. He has this deliberate faith. And as this dad gets there and he finds out that his son is alive and he's getting better, what's crazy is, is what we see in these next few verses. And in verse 53 and in 54, it says, The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. What's crazy here and what we see here is that... Uh, his faith is really strong now. But what's important to understand is whenever it says that he, his whole household believed, it's not saying, it is not saying that because he believed, everyone now believes, everyone's saved. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is because he believed, because of what he has experienced and because of what Jesus has told him, he now is on fire for God. So he's going back to his home. He's now telling everyone his story. He's now telling everyone his testimony. And they all believe. And they all start to have this strong belief and this faith in Jesus through his story. Y'all, you have a story. Those of you who have asked Jesus into your heart, you have a story. And it, there may be, here's the thing, no matter it's a story of I grew up, I had a great life, I went to church my whole life, and then whenever I was 12 years old, I asked Jesus into my heart, or it's I lived this life and I sinned and I was um, arrested and I was, whatever it may be, your story is important. No matter if it's this crazy story where, oh my gosh, God transformed everything. My life was crazy until I met him. Or it's the story of, I had a really good life, but I still realized that I needed, I needed Jesus. You have a story. 
And as you're telling someone that story, that that story is going to help them have a better understanding that Jesus loves us all. And he cares for every one of us. But also what we see in this is that men, we need to step it up. In this story, you see this dad come home and he tells everyone and everyone wants to follow Christ. Dads, men, are we doing the same thing in our own house? Are we being the leaders in our own house? Are we showing people Are we showing our children? Are we showing the people that we work with? Are we showing our neighbors the importance of who God is? Women, are are you guys doing that as well? Are you going to your workplaces or to your homes? Are you pouring into the people that you see each and every single day? Because we all have a story and God can work through every single one of us. And whether it means that you have a child who is sick and is dying on their bed or whether that means that your life is still great but yet you still have some struggles, are we allowing ourselves to step out of our own house, step out of these doors and tell people our story? Are we choosing to have deliberate faith? You see, Jesus came to save us from our sins, but... It's important to understand that we've seen these signs and these miracles. No, he wants us to trust him because we should love him because he died on the cross for you and for me. How amazing is he? Are we choosing to live our life for him? Are we choosing to have deliberate faith? Are we choosing to go into battle for him? You see, I told you guys the story of before we came here, right? And what's crazy is in that time, in that difficulty when I had that desperate faith of, well, God, what are you going to do? What I didn't understand was he was already in the works. He already had something planned out. And even though I didn't know what that thing was at that time, and even though my life felt like it was crumbling, and and my wife was having to be there and say, it's okay, we're going to get through this, we're going to be able to pull through this, you still have that anxiety. You still have that feeling of, gosh, Lord, what's going to happen? I was losing control, and I had to trust, and I had to have deliberate faith and know that God was in control intern for one month while you're trying to find something. That was humbling. That was hard. Because I go from being a pastor at a very large mega church in Houston to a a pastor at a church in Tulsa to a pastor at a church in Tulsa, and now I'm an intern again? Wow. Hello. That hit. But it was so humbling because that time that we were at that church, they were so gracious and they were so loving that our hearts were able to heal during that time. We were able to go to church and feel like we were loved. It was so wonderful. But then at the same time, I get this call from my best friend saying, hey, I'm interviewing at a church in Cincinnati. And this opportunity opened up. You want to come? Now, some of you guys have heard the story. Stacy was like, uh, no. <laughs> and I was like, let's check it out. But God was in the works. And that month ended, and two weeks later, we moved to Cincinnati. Listen. In our lives, we might be battling. We might be dealing with things where maybe it's the job. Maybe it is our relationships and our marriages. Maybe it is school. Maybe it's, you know, I I don't know, our kids. We're all dealing with something. We're always all busy. And there's something that makes it so difficult each and every day. 
but God, even though he may not answer the way you want him to answer, he's still in control if you allow him to be in control. If you're laying this at his feet and you're saying, God, I'm giving this to you because I, I, there's nothing else I can do. Listen, he may not give you the answer right away. It took me three months before this happened. That was a lot of learning. That was a lot of frustration. That was a lot of heartbreak. But yet, the entire time he was in control, he knew the answer. I just had to listen. Now, if everything didn't happen in Tulsa, would we still have come up here? I would like to say yes. I don't know. But what I do know is we've been here for five years now, and we're blessed because we were obedient to what God had asked us to do, because we listened and we were trying to be deliberate in our faith. And now I can look at my kids and I can say, this happened to your dad. But because of God, he's blessed us. And we're here with an amazing church family. Think about what's happening in your life. Think about the things that's going on. It's scary. It's trying. But know that he's right there.